Advancing the cause of liberty takes more than just coming up with ideas. It means making them happen. This is Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Hey everyone, Connor here for a solo episode of Society and the State. Uh, This is episode number 67 going to be linking to a few things today if uh, what I'm talking about piques your interest because I am sharing uh, the 10th anniversary of my first political activism, the thing that sucked me into uh, trying to make a difference. Ten years ago today, uh, there was a call that was uh, placed onto a domestic violence shelter hotline. And uh, this was a call from a woman claiming to be a 16-year-old victim of physical and sexual abuse at the YFZ Ranch um, in Texas. This uh, YFZ, Yearning for Zion, this was a ranch for a community of uh, members of the Fundamentalist uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, sect, uh, commonly known as FLDS. This uh, call was placed. It led to, uh, many listeners may recall, a massive raid uh, on this ranch that I'll be talking about today. And and how uh, I became involved and what that has led to um, ever since. So this call was placed. Um, she, The woman, uh, the girl, identified herself as uh, Sarah. Um, so investigators uh, were able to later trace the call, and they found out that it was uh, actually made by a much older woman uh, named Rosita Swinton, who had been arrested for previous hoax calls posting as abused and victimized girls. So she has this like knack for doing this. She has a criminal history with it. And here here she is doing it again. So this is a false tip. She was falsely claiming to be a 16-year-old victim of abuse on the ranch. uh, But they didn't know it at the time. So this call triggered a massive uh, operation at the ranch. So Texas law enforcement and child welfare uh, individuals began, uh, you know, cordoning off the entire area, area, locking things down um, just uh, a few days later. And law enforcement uh, had, you know, uh, automatic weapons. SWAT teams were there with snipers. They had helicopters. They had an armored personnel carrier as backup. Uh, but there was no armed resistance by the FLDS. But they, I mean, it's almost like Waco, like if you, you know, just this massive uh, militarized response. Now, the authorities, from their position, they believed that the children had been abused or were at, you know, risk of future abuse. Uh, actually, they, they, the words I believe they used were immediate risk of future abuse, um, and uh, according to one of the state's spokesmen. And so they search the ranch, they go through everything, they go into the their temples, you know, safe and uh, vault and locked desk drawers and beds. Uh, you know, they found evidence that led them to believe that, you know, the beds, uh, there were these beds in the temple and that they were, you know, being used with underage girls and and a lot of this horrible stuff. And of course, uh, uh, Warren Jeffs, the head of FLDS to this day, is uh, in prison and facing all these, you know, charges and going through all these court procedures stemming from a lot of the evidence that they discovered, you know, in this raid. So a lot of people look at that and say, oh, great, you know, and we got the guy. What a sleazeball. And yeah, like total sleazeball, right? If they're doing this with underage girls who can't consent, like that's hor- horrible. Like nobody condones that. Um, you know, certainly you should be adults. You should uh, be able to consent, uh, whether you object to, you know, polygamy or not as a separate question, uh, uh, you know, for another day. But, but the problem here, the reason that I got involved was, uh, ends don't justify means, right? And so this massive raid sure ended up uncovering evidence that, you know, has been used in criminal prosecution, but this raid caused significant harm and violated due process. And why? Well, because in the process, because of the belief that uh, these children were going to face future abuse or potentially were facing existing abuse, um, authorities under the um, authorization from J- uh, Judge Walter in the 51st District Court, they removed all children, including the boys, 17 years and under. This was 462 children that were immediately placed in the care and custody of the state of Texas. And if you're familiar with the foster care system, and at least at the time in Texas, as I recall from my research, there was a lot of you know abuse <laughs> of its own within the foster care system. So you're tearing these children from uh, what we can only presume to be loving, caring families and placing them in an environment where uh, that is unlikely uh, or potentially unlikely to be the case. 462 children removed. 
they were uh, put in custody of the the uh, child welfare services. Um, you know, I think like a hundred women, a bunch of the mothers left the ranch as well to accompany, you know, some of the children, uh, under the age of four children were allowed to stay with their mothers until they did DNA testing, uh, so that they could, you know, identify who belonged to whom. And once that DNA testing was complete, then only children under 18 months were allowed to stay with their, uh, mothers indefinitely. Right. And so, um, here I am, I'm in Utah, not even in the same state. I think I caught it on, uh, on the news, uh, a little bit and, uh, and, and just got enraged, right? It wasn't until like, what, let's see, April, May, June, like two and a half months later that the children were uh, returned. And uh, what's interesting about that is that there were two superior courts that knocked down the this ruling from this Judge Walter, right? Because immediately people are trying to go into court and appeal and, and litigate this, like, hey, this is wrong. And so two of the higher courts knocked down this judge's, uh, this this order, from this, you know, what I at the time believed and probably still believe is was a power hungry woman. This was just an insanely broad order um, to 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 authorize. So, you know, she's uh, gets stricken down by the two higher courts, uh, gets reversed, basically says, you know, put a stop to this. So she delayed her consent over the weekend, uh, claiming at the time that she wanted every FLDS mother to sign the order before she would. Uh, but she finally ordered the release of all children with with one exception. Um, and that's interesting, right? Because, uh, the, the claim in her order was that the one girl that was not allowed to be released under her order was an identified victim of sexual abuse. So they went from 462 to one, right? They, they violate the rights of hundreds of children, families, separating them from their families, causing lasting trauma, right? Uh, subjecting them to potential abuse in these non-familial circumstances in foster care, uh, all because of what they found uh, in the order, uh, according to the order, was one identified uh, victim of sexual abuse. But under the order, um, that even in releasing the children, they were still the judge was still giving custody or gi- still giving authority for the Department of Family and Protective Services to visit and interview the children. Uh, unannounced visits that could entail medical, psychological, or psychiatric examinations. The parents would uh, were not allowed under the order to be uh, to intervene. And the judge required as a condition of releasing these children back to their parents, the judge required in her order that the parents had to attend and complete parenting classes, uh, remain in the state of Texas, and notify the government within 48 hours of any trip more than 100 miles from their homes. So they're handcuffed. Even in getting their children back, they had all these limits placed upon them, even though like all of these other allegations, this, this, the breadth of this uh, request uh, this court order was just insanely large and, and did not find systematic widespread abuse. Um, there is a reason that when the founders created the Fourth Amendment and stipulated the warrant requirement, it required what's called particularity. You have to particularly suspect crime. You have to go over, you know, a judge can't just say or shouldn't be able to say, yeah, go search through that entire neighborhood to see if you find, you know, a baggie of marijuana. No, like you got to know which house. You got to know, is it upstairs or downstairs? You got to have evidence to know the particular location, the particular uh, person, right? So if, if this one child that they kept was an identified victim of sexual abuse, if they had any knowledge uh, that, that Warren, any evidence that Warren Jeffs was indeed, you know, abusing, I went, great, right? Investigate it, get a warrant for it, prosecute it, litigate it, go after it, Uh the problem here was the breadth. The problem is violating the rights of the many in hopes of, you know, potentially protecting the few or, or the one, right? So here I'm in Utah. I see this happening. Um, I think, let's see, this was uh, 2008. So the, the date of this recording, uh, March 29th, uh, 2018. So it's 10 years ago that that, that call was, uh, uh, was placed uh, that triggered this entire avalanche. And so... I see this unfolding on the news. I think, you know, it was of interest in Utah just because of kind of the FLDS polygamy type connection. So it got, you know, some airplay on on local press here. And, you know, I'm at the time, let's see, so I'm 30, oh, how old was I? No, I'm 20, 2000, man, my, my math is hard. I'm like uh, 27, right? Uh, newly married for uh, a few months. Um, I'm a blogger. I'm a web developer. You know, I'm just reading books and jotting my thoughts on my blog. Nothing special, 
uh, wasn't really involved in any, you know, activism of any sort per se. So I see this happening and I just get pissed. Like, I don't know anything legal, right? I don't know fourth amendment stuff too deeply and particularity and warrant requirements and court processes and court orders and all this kind of stuff. I just, it just rubs me the wrong way, right? Like it, it just violates my sense of justice. Um, and so I start, uh, at the time an online petition and, you know, back in the day to the, the decade, like, okay, there's petitions all over the place. Now at the time, that was kind of the way to be active online, right? We're going to start a petition and they weren't very, you know, popular, or very commonly used. And so we started a petition and, uh, we got a thousand signatures, uh, in a, you know, very short amount of time, I think, you know, a day to something like that. And so just all these people jump onto this petition because this is like happening live Everyone's freaking out about, it, especially in the kind of broader polygamous community. Like these people have been subjected to all sorts of uh, violations of their rights over the decades, and so this is kind of tr- uh, triggering past uh, civil liberties violations, especially for a lot of the older folks in the polyg- uh, polygamous community who remember some of the other problems that they've dealt with with law enforcement, with the government. And so uh, we get a ton of petitions. And so I issued a press release. Um, you know, I think that was the first press release I've ever written. In fact, I. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I'll have to link to this on the, um, on the, uh, on the show notes page for today, societyinthestate.com slash 67. Let me just read a little bit. I haven't, I haven't looked at this in years. Uh, so this may say really stupid stuff, but, um, but, but let's dive into it. Cause it shows, you know, how I got started and what I'm trying to do. And I'm like probably Googling like how to write a press release, you know, like I don't know what I'm doing. So here, here's at least a part of the press release uh, written April 20th, 2008. Uh, so this is uh, a couple of weeks after um, the, the raid happened. <clears throat> it says, uniting their voices in opposition to Texas authorities removal of what was then 416 children from the Yearning for Zion community in El Dorado, Texas. Over 1,000 individuals have signed an online petition which demands the release of the detained persons as well as an apology for the so-called, quote, acts of aggression conducted by Texas officials. Connor Boyack, a Lehigh, Utah resident, started the online petition on April 15th in order to help call attention to the abuse of civil liberties he believes is taking place. Quote, as I talked with others about the situation, I was surprised to see how many people opposed the actions of the Texas government, Boyack said. Quote, while most people disagree with the FLDS religion and its practices, myself included, People are frustrated to see the ways their civil liberties have been ignored and to see the government's aggression, end quote. Uh, Having first collected the signatures online, Boyack will soon be sending a copy of the petition to Texas Governor Rick Perry, Senator Hutchison, Cornyn, Commissioner Cockrell, the Department of Family Services, Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here. Okay, this was this is where I'm remembering the the research from. Uh, In the press release, it says Boyack cited a 2006 report from the Texas Comptroller that reveals startling information about the Texas foster care system into which these children are likely to be placed. According to the report, children in the Texas foster care system are four times more likely to die than children in the general Texas population. It also reports that in 2004, so this is just a few years earlier, 100 foster children received treatment for poisoning from medications, 63 received medical treatment for rape that occurred while in the foster care system, and 142 children gave birth uh, while in the system. Um, and so, you know, then it's got on here. Okay. I talked to Salt Lake Tribune, uh, ACLU issued a statement, other K- So KSL did a video, a couple videos, Associated Press picked it up, uh, Fox 13, uh, Catholic.org picked it up. So all the, you know, Idaho, uh, uh, papers start writing it up. So I kind of compiled on here years ago, um, some of the responses and some of the reactions that we were getting. And, and, you know, again, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know politicians. I, I just like, Hey, let's, uh, let's start a pe- petition. Let's, uh, send a, a letter, um, to these elected officials, you know, and surely they'll do something about it. I, I don't know that I was so naive to think that they would actually uh, do anything per se. Um, but you know, I thought that that, that was important to do, um, and to, to still try, you know, I sent stuff. It looks like here to Orrin Hatch, Bob Bennett. Of course I get like these form letters, uh, from their staff. Um, but no one else was, you know, doing anything. And so you read like the comments on my blog at the time and the petition, like these people were so grateful 
to have somebody standing up, to have somebody be a voice, especially, I should note, someone who was not at all connected to the issue. If some FLDS person would have gotten up and doing it, right, that would have been dismissed as biased and, and incredible, and uh, people would not have perceived that to be any sort of voice of authority or neutrality, uh, certainly. Um, and so while, you know, that person, someone in the trenches connected to the issue should absolutely speak up. It showed to me the importance of someone on the sidelines, some third party observer saying, I see what's happening over there and I don't like it. I think it is wrong. I think it is uh, an injustice. And so this was uh, not only really the first bit of pol political activism, but you know, it was activism that had nothing to do with myself. We see all the time, right? Examples of people who are harmed by the government. Just the other day, I saw a farmer uh, online starting his own petition and uh, the city and the state, they're trying to take his land and there's all sorts of shady stuff happening. And and so he's, you know, um, trying to oppose that. Rightly so. He should stand up for himself and he's bringing others to his aid, uh, rallying, you know, people who eat at his farm and have worked at his farm. And it's going great. He's rallied a lot of people and he should stand up. Uh, but, you know, then they and others have reached out to us to say, hey, we need these these sideline people. We need other organizations and individuals in the community who can weigh in because it adds such strength when you have someone not invested in the issue, someone not biased, et cetera, who can uh, kind of stand up as a neutral third party and say, look, I've, I've kind of listened to both sides. I've seen what's going on here and I side with this person because then you can bring a lot of other people along with you, right? When, when I would uh, do the media for this FLDS uh, raid stuff, I was very clear that like, look, I got nothing to do with FLDS. I disagree with their religion, disagree with polygamy, et cetera, et cetera. And yet what's happening to them is wrong. Because then a lot of people can sympathize with that, right? They're in the same situation. They oppose what Warren Jeffs is doing and they don't like polygamy and they don't like FLDS. So we say, look, all of that notwithstanding, it's still okay to stand up for their rights, to stand up for due process. Um, I'm reminded of the Pastor Niemöller quote in Germany, one of the pastors trying to uh, stand up to the rise of the Nazi regime. Uh, and he says, you know, first they came for the, uh, I can't remember how it goes, right? First they came for this disenfranchised group and I said nothing. Then they came for that disenfranchised group and I said nothing. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak up, right? Um, and, and that's the whole point here. The, the lesson that I learned from that event is not only how to write a press release, how to do an interview. I think it was my first TV interview. Um, and so I'll, I'll link to this again on societyinthestate.com slash 67. Um, so you can uh, see a 10 year old uh, Connor pretending like he knows what he's talking about. Um, but, you know, so I, I learned those things. I, I started to kind of gain experience and um, you know, the, the reporters came over to my condo and just filmed me at my crappy little Walmart desk. I mean, it, it, it's good times, right? To look back at this stuff and chuckle, um, and see how far you've come. But the whole point is, um, it, it was my first taste of helping somebody else. It was my first experience of standing up for someone else who perhaps couldn't uh, stand up for themselves or standing up in a way that had more of an impact and brought more attention than someone who was just part of the you know, so-called problem trying to stand up for themselves. And that to me has been a motivating factor ever since that all around us, the government is harming people. There are violations of people's rights, their, their liberties, their due process, and they need an advocate. They need someone to stand up for us. And in some cases, when it's an actual legal problem, you know, they hire an attorney and that attorney can be their advocate and try and help uh, them navigate the legal system and fight the charges or whatever. A lot of cases, they're poor right? They can't afford an attorney. So maybe they have an uh, indigent defense. They have an appointed attorney, which these guys are overworked, underpaid. A lot of them are perhaps incompetent. Uh, and, and so uh, they're not represented well. They don't have a good advocate. Uh, the person spends 10 minutes with them and then has to move on to somebody else. And so, um, but a lot of cases are not legal. Uh, a lot of cases are political. They're, they're social. They're, um, you know, there's there's no criminal charges that you're fighting in court. It's just, hey, you know, for example, let's use the same example. Ten years later, uh, we are still working with polygamists to try and decriminalize polygamy here in our home state of Utah. It is a felony uh, to be a polygamist. And so that pushes these people into the shadows, even if they're otherwise upstanding, law-abiding, loving, peaceful people. And I know many of them. And, and this felony status is a cloud hanging over them. It makes it difficult you know, to get a job. It makes them difficult to go out into the community. They're worried that someone's going to call the cops. You may be familiar with the, uh, what's it on? I think TLC, the 
the uh, sister wives show. I've actually never watched a single episode of it, but uh, Cody Brown and his wives, and they were uh, investigated here actually in my home city of Lehigh. Uh, the city prosecutor started going after them and, and that led to uh, them fleeing the state because they were worried. Um, I think they're, you know, fled to Las Vegas. If I remember right, they had to just get out of Dodge because they were worried about being uh, prosecuted as, as felons. So we've been trying to change the law with these guys. Here I am on the sidelines, our organization, not at all connected to polygamy, but we're saying this is wrong. They should not be felons. This has to change. They can't hire an attorney for that. They're not actually being prosecuted currently. Uh, in fact, you know, the prosecutors have basically been told by the attorney general's office, don't do it because we know that this won't survive a constitutional challenge uh, head on. Um, and so they, they aren't charged with it, but it's this looming cloud that affects them in many ways. And, and entire generations of, of yeah, these people are growing up and, and their families learning uh, that they're all felons. They're all criminals in the eyes of their government. I mean, what message does that send, um, you know, in terms of enfranchisement and interacting with the broader society? We want these people to interact and be productive members of our society and and, and get to know others and contribute and everything else. But if they're suppressed in the shadows, bad stuff happens there. So anyways, whole point here is we're still fighting this battle. We're still standing up for them uh, on the sidelines. And that's, you know, of course, one of many different issues. Um, but the point for me, looking, reflecting back as I uh, have over the past few hours uh, today before recording this, 10 years later after that call was placed, you know, a lot for me has changed. I've learned a lot of lessons. I have made a ton of mistakes. There's no manual for doing this stuff. Uh, but to me, the lesson is someone has to do it and it can be a, you know, 20, however old I was, 26, 27 year old kid that has no clue what he's doing, that just starts doing something and seeing where it leads and people are grateful and you gain the experience and then you continue learning. Um, I, I get questions a lot now, 10 years on, like, Hey, how do I do something like that? And what do I do? And how do I get involved? And, you know, can you help me with this? And, and the message that I generally send is just start doing it. There, there's no right answer necessarily. Like, sure, I can give some tips from things that I've learned. But uh, to me, the lesson 10 years later is just start. Just do something. Stand up. Use your voice, especially with social media and, and everything uh, that's developed. You know, it's much easier to have a voice. It's much easier to make a difference uh, to get your message out there. Um, I look back 10 years ago and a lot has changed, but not a lot. There's still a lot of problems. There's still uh, a lot of people who could speak up who don't. Um, and so uh, I found my voice. Th this this is the uh, issue that prompted me uh, to pay attention, to get involved, and to stand up for others. Um, and hopefully uh, you've encountered something yourself that has animated you and motivated you to, uh, to get involved. But to me, the lesson is just do it. Just start. Uh, open your mouth. Pick an issue. You know, I had no idea that... <laughs> You know, this polygamy issue would be what got me involved. And it even wasn't even really polygamy per se, right? This was just a massive violation of uh, people's Fourth Amendment rights um, and, and due process. And, and that's a core issue. That's a core American issue, a core liberty issue to not have the government be able to just indiscriminately and broadly, uh, you know, separate uh, children from their families. That's a horrendous thing. So there are plenty of other examples of bad behavior and, and awful stuff happening. So, uh, you know, hopefully one of those motivates you, gets you involved, stand up, speak up. Uh, and we'll see where you are in 10 years. Hope that was interesting for you guys. Just been reflecting a bit today and wanted to uh, share some thoughts with you. As I said, I'll link to some of these old uh, news articles, uh, videos, and so forth if you uh, want to kind of see a little bit more of uh, what it looks like when someone's first getting started and see some of the little embarrassing uh, uh, stuff that can happen along the way. So that's going to be at societyinthestate.com slash 67. Uh, guys, next episode I think is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's all about how to market yourself. Uh, we got Zach Slayback joining us, so make sure you're subscribed. Next episode's going to be good, so stick around, societyandthestate.com, and we'll see you then. You've been listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com. 